Good morning, everyone. Are you happy to be in church today? Thank you. That was great. That was so much better than the 8.30. 8.30 was barely awake. They're like, they're like it's 8.30. You should be glad we're here. <laughs> Thanks for being here today. Um, I just want to emphasize again about our City Kids Camp. Uh, it, it did, it filled up very fast. So parents, please be diligent this afternoon. Don't be napping at 3 p.m. Um, we had a few people miss the deadline last year and emailed us and tried to manipulate us into registering their kids. And we're like, it's full. What do you want us to do? So parents, uh, it was, it was so good last year. Uh, you don't want your kids to miss out on this summer. It's going to be great. You can sign up for that. And then also, Palm Sunday, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. We're going to be celebrating with our brothers and sisters around the globe the resurrection of Jesus. Um, man, it's so good to be part of the church, so good to be part of the body of Christ. And we have been saying, you know, we've got invitations on your seat um, for you to give out to somebody. Now, specifically with this service, if you think, I'm going to bring 25 people to this service next week, just go to the 830 with your friends, all right? There's a few more seats available or the 12. Um, you can't, if you have a, you can't bring like, you can, we're gonna have overflow. But again, I'm recommending if you're bringing a ton of extra people, go to the 830 or the 12. It'd just be a little bit better for crowd control for us next week, but it's gonna be an awesome Sunday. You don't wanna miss out on it. All right, we are finishing our series today, as Michael said, called True Image. And in this series, we are talking about the subject of identity. And uh, a little bit what we're doing is just a kind of a response um, to the discussion that's happening in the world, the confusion that's happening in the world as it relates to the subject of identity and we have on offer to us um, from culture today some ways that I guess that we're supposed to think about identity or talk about identity that is sort of being imposed on us. But what we're doing in this series is that we're actually discovering there are other ways to think about this. Um, and I think there is a biblical, there's a godly way to think about this. Um, and, and as we're discussing this, what we're wanting to be aware of, that this is just a moment in time in which this is the way people people are talking about a certain thing that they weren't talking about 20 years ago. This is what you have to know if you're a young person and if you're in university today, nobody was talking like this 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And then probably 50 years from now, no one's going to be talking like this either, but there's going to be some whole other crazy issue um, that we're going to be discussing. But thank God, if we go to the word of God, we can actually find out some answers that God has spoken to us related to this subject of identity so we don't have to be confused because there is just a lot of confusion. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding, a lot of, um, and again, again, a lot of this is targeted at young people, just like, I don't know who I am or I'm a this or I'm a that, but thank God he's already spoken to us who we are in Christ. So we don't have to be confused about this, this subject and that we don't have to necessarily embrace Um, the verbiage, the wording, the talking points of the culture of the moment that we can actually go to the word of God and say what God says about us because this is such an important subject. So really identity is who you are. You're an amalgam of your memories, experiences, relationships, values, and ultimately it's the characteristics that determine who a person is. Now when we think about our identity, again, we're, we're realizing and we're understanding that because I've had a bunch of experiences, some good, some bad, and, and some of those bad things can affect my identity in a negative way and can confuse me and, and it could be a struggle for me. But what we wanted to do with some intentionality, with some purposefulness to be like, what is my identity in God? Not just looking to my past, to the mistakes that I made, to the negative stuff that's happened to me and have that just form who I am in this moment, But God has something to say. God has his plans. He has his purposes. He has his thoughts related to this subject. And this is what he's wanting um, us to embrace. And again, what we're wanting to do, and as we've been doing in this series, like this is who God says I am. And so if God identifies me as this, my creator, my savior, this is what I identify as or who I identify as. Um, Because this, again, is 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 a really confusing point for a lot of people. So God declares it, and then we're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to align with who my creator and my savior says that I am. So our desire should be to have this true image in myself, in Christ, in culture, 
there's gonna be something on offer to you as that relates to your identity and your image and who you are and all the rest of it. But in Christ, this is what we're discovering. We, we see this phrase over and over again as we've been studying this, in Christ, in him, through him. And all of these things are identifiers for us related to who God says we are. And this is what we want to embrace as Christ followers. Um, this is a, a, a thing, again, there, there's, there's a way to talk about this in culture, but as followers of Jesus, we just can't go the ways of the world. We just can't necessarily embrace all of these phrases that are being said. It's like, God, what do you say about this? What have you already said? What have you already said about me by creating me and saving me so that I'm not confused about this subject? And when we think about um, what's, what's being said now as it relates to identity, again, it's just a philosophy. It's just a way of thinking. And again, philosophy is just a branch of thought. It's a great study for you to go and study the great philosophers and, and what they said and what they thought and how it showed up in cultures. It's an interesting thing. But here in this moment, we have a very specific philosophy as it relates to identity that is just in the air we breathe. It's on the screens that we watch. And so what we don't want to do as, as followers of Jesus is get caught up into it. So here, the Apostle Paul helps us with some of these thoughts. Colossians chapter two, verse six says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, so again, for followers of Jesus, so walk in him, rooted and built up, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So yes, I've said yes to Jesus and my roots should actually go down in Christ, in God, what does God say about who I am and what I'm supposed to do? So he continues and he says in verse eight, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So again, ways of thinking. So Paul is, again, he's realizing the church is living in a world that has philosophies. And then what does he say about these philosophies? They could just take you captive. And again, this is so easy to do in this time, especially for young people of the world that they're living in, just this way of thinking, this way of talking, it can just take you captive. But what is it? It's just empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. They're man-made ideas. As opposed to what does God, what does my creator say about me? What does my savior say about me? And not be taken captive by philosophies of the world, and, I, and that's what I'm saying. There, there is something specific in this moment that we want to realize this is counterfeit. That there is a true, that there is a healthier way to think about me and my identity than what's on offer to us in the world. Because again, this is not the only factor, but there's record levels of depression and, and suicidal ideation and all of this confusion that um, people are facing. And part of it is this discussion around identity. But again, we want to go back to the word of God and we want to find ourselves in Christ, in him. Who does my savior say? Who does my creator say that I am and not allow our feelings to define us? Because again, this is the big part of the, the phrasing that we hear would be like, be your true self, express yourself, be your authentic self. Whatever you feel is who you are. But how many of your feelings go up and down? Does anyone know that this is true? That someday my feelings are on the mountaintop, someday my feelings are in the valley, so if I'm gonna identify just with what I feel in this moment, I'm gonna make a wrong choice. That there's gonna be something beyond just what I feel in any given moment. That there has to be some sort of objective reality that God has for me to walk in as my, again, my creator and my savior. And we want to be intentional about it. Having our identity formed in God. So the option, the thing that we're talking about, because again, the, depending on your social media algorithm, you're gonna be fed certain things, certain thoughts, and either side of this discussion and the cultural discussion will end up somewhere. But God has his thoughts, his third option for us, and it is to go to the word of God and see what he says. Acts chapter 17, verse 28 says, in him, we live and move and have our being in him who? In Christ, in God. The giver of life knows something about my life. Not just my feelings, not just what I say. That I have life in God. I get to breathe because a creator has given me life. So he has something to say about the life 
that I live. So in this series so far, we've talked about being made by God and remade in Christ. And the the scripture calls us children of light, children of God. He calls us chosen, royal, and holy, set apart for God's purposes. We talked about moving past our past and leaning on the grace and mercy of God, not being defined by our mistakes. And then last week on Baptism Sunday, we talked about that the word of God calls us the righteousness of God and he calls us redeemed. And these are all identifiers for us from the word of God. And we should say the things that God says about us. So if you missed any of those messages, I, I encourage you to go back, not just because I preached them, but because I really feel like this is an important topic for us to understand in this time. So today, as we finish off this series, we're gonna be talking about the idea that all of us have a God-given purpose that we have a God-given purpose. Now, the word purpose just means deliberate intention, an aim, an end goal, a reason. That this is true for us, that we're not just blobs of meat who are able to think, that we're not just animated stardust, that there is actually a purpose for our lives. And this is actually what we believe about our lives, that there is something for us, that, that God has actually designed us for a purpose. And what we, should, what we should want to know is, what is the purpose for my life? Because if we don't know God's purpose for my life, it's gonna be very easy for us to be subject to the winds of chains, subject to opinions, subject to distortion. And all of these things, again, there's a lot of voices out there. And if we don't know God's purpose for my life, then we can just be susceptible to all of these other ways of thinking, all of these other thoughts that are out there. And again, they're on offer. They're available. They're everywhere. But what we want to know and what we want to discover is God's purpose for my life. Now, when we think about purpose, you know, there's so many things in our life that has a purpose. And so I I have this fossil watch that I wear that my dad bought me about 10 years ago. It's a little bit scratched up on the face and I've changed the battery about two or three times, but I love the band. It's kind of, you know, the 10 year patina. It's looking good, old leather. Do you know what I'm talking about? But the question I have for you today, is this a good watch? Is it a good watch? How do you know? How do we know that it's a good watch? Because what makes a watch a good watch? What is the purpose of a watch? What is some of you saying? I don't know what you're saying. (laughs) What is the ultimate purpose of a watch? To tell time. So my watch has a reason. My watch has a purpose. What about your shoes that you're wearing today? Are, Are they good shoes? (laughs) <laughs> Somebody's wearing their bad shoes today. I'm like, I don't know. How do we know that your shoes are good? Right, because maybe they're comfortable on my feet, that they have a reason, that they have a purpose. They're designed for something. What about you? Do you have a reason? Do you have a purpose from your creator? See, what if, what if I were to take my watch off and there was a nail sticking out of the stage and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna use my watch to hammer in this nail. Is this watch a good hammer? No, why? Because I'd be using it for its non-intended purpose. See, and again, this, this, what, this is what happens to us in, in the current cultural conversation, that things and people and lives get used for their non-intended purpose, and it's just a hard way to live. But God already knows what he's designed us for, what he's made us for, what he's saved us for, so we don't have to be confused. God, what is your purpose for my life? See, we're, we're free in Canada. I make a joke about this a lot. We're free in Canada, right? Mostly based on what? The laws and the constitution and the bill of rights. And so there's things that are legal in Canada to do that aren't good for you. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Well, it's not illegal, Pastor Brent. Well, it's like, it doesn't mean it's good for you. It doesn't mean that it's, it's the intended purpose for your life. 
But then again, those of us that are our Christ followers, we're not just living under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the laws of Canada. We are actually living in another kingdom, a kingdom ruled by God. And this is what Jesus came to preach. He came to preach about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And so even though that in Canada, in the cultural moment, things are said to be okay, and this is really not hurting anybody, and what does it matter what I do? It does actually matter what you do. It's important what you do because God has an intended purpose for you has something for your life. He created you. You aren't just animated stardust. You have a spirit. You have a purpose. Your body has a purpose. And all of us, all of this, what we've been talking about in this series is so that we would discover what is my God-given purpose because I didn't create myself. I didn't save myself. There's something else about me that's really important. It's Jesus came preaching the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 4, 17 says this. For that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, synonymous terms. And what is Jesus saying? Repent. It's a loaded religious term, but really the term repent just means turn around and go the other way to change your mind. Why would I change my mind? Well, the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the place of God's rule, the place of God's authority, God's way of doing things. And those of us that are Christ followers, this is what I'm asking us to wrestle with in this series is what's being said to us in culture as it relates to identity. Is this God's way or is it just man's way? Is this just me and what I feel in this moment? Because what is God asking us to do? What is Jesus saying? us Turn around and go the way of God. Go the way of your creator. Go the way of the giver of life because the giver of life understands what's best about your life because he created you with a purpose not as a watch to hammer a nail. Not for you to identify as something else that he didn't create you to be. He has a reason for us. Amen. Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And in the context of this chapter, one of the things being discussed is the things for my life, the things that I need for my life very, in a very practical sense. But what should we do? Seek after the kingdom of God. And this is the antithesis is what's on offer to us in the moment in culture regarding identity. Because it's all about your feelings and how you feel in this moment. But here, what is it? I'm gonna seek after the kingdom of God. There's something beyond me. I'm created for a purpose. That I would seek after God's ways for my life. What is the aim of my life? What is the intended purpose for me? God has an intention for your life. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 says this, who saved us and called us to a holy calling set apart. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. His own purpose, not my purpose, not what I can decide, not what somebody else would say. God saved me for his own purposes. And we think about salvation, what God is doing is he's returning us back to the Garden of Eden pre the fall where man, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day that we would enter back into this relationship with God. And this is the purpose of God for everybody in this room, for everybody on the planet, that we would walk with God, that we would have God influencing our lives as our father, as our savior, as our creator, saved us for his own purpose, 
not mine, not what I can dream up, not what culture says. God, what do you say? What is your purpose for my life? He wants to walk with us. And when he's walking with us, he would touch and speak into and form every aspect of our lives. And for us to operate like this, we have to stay humble. Amen. Because otherwise we just do what we want when we want to do it. This is what I feel in this moment. This is what I want to do. And ultimately, if, if you think, again, philosophically, if there is no purpose for your life, it doesn't actually matter what you do at all. Like, at all. One pastor said, if there's, no, if there's no God, it doesn't matter if you go out hugging or mugging. It doesn't matter. It, doesn't, it wouldn't matter. You do whatever. You just do whatever. But nobody lives like that. But there is actually a meaning and a purpose for your life. A God-given one. But for us to walk in it, we have to be humble. We can't just talk like the world talks. We can't just talk the philosophies of the moment. We have to be like, God, what do you say about me? I know I feel this, but what do you say? What do you say about my life? 1 Corinthians 4, 1 says this. This is how we should regard us. I love this. Paul is talking about us, the church. Servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So what are we? Servants of Christ, serve Jesus, not serving ourselves. It's not what we do as Christians. And then we are a steward of the mysteries of God. What is a steward? A manager. And your life is a little bit of a mystery. But we're managing it. It's a gift. It's on loan to us for a little while. It's a gift from God that we can breathe and think and talk and walk. So we're managing this gift from God, this purpose and nature from God. Listen, moreover, it is required that stewards be found faithful. So what are we supposed to be faithful to? The ideologies of the world? Or what does God say about me? Supposed to be found faithful to what God says. But with me is a very small thing that I should be judged, that I should be judged by one of you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. So I love what Paul is saying is, you know, because again, we hear these phrases and we talk this way. It's like, who are you to judge me? Nobody can judge me. And Paul says, I don't even judge myself because this is how we think. And then he says in verse four, for I'm not aware of anything against myself. So Paul is like saying, he's just making an honest statement. It's like, in this moment, I don't know right now if I have any sin or judgment against me. As far as I can decide for myself, I'm perfect and I'm great and I'm good. This is what Paul is saying and this would be how we would think. But then what he continues, but I am not thereby acquitted just because I think that I'm okay or I'm a good guy. It is the Lord who judges me. What does it mean to judge, to decide? What is Paul saying? He's like, I think I'm fine, but ultimately I'm yielding, I'm submitting my life to God. It is the Lord, it is the creator, it is the savior who knows the purpose of my life. I'm going to submit myself to what he says, not just what I think or feel. Man, and this is some humility, right? I think I'm great, I'm good. Okay, you know what? But just because I say I'm good, it doesn't mean I'm good. What do I have to do? As a steward of the life given, I would submit it to God. God, what do you say? What do you say about me and my life, my body and who I am, what you say about family for me? What do you say? See, we should know that God knows what's best for me. Psalm 139, verse seven says this. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? Do I have any prodigal sons and daughters in the room? 
and you tried to run away from God. And the question is, where are you going? Where are we going? In the midst of God's creation, in the midst of where his spirit is everywhere, where are we running to that we just do our own thing? Where can I flee? Where can I run away from the calling of God, the calling of God on my life? Not just what I want, just what I feel, not just what I think, not just what I identify as, the calling of God on my life. See, I, I, when I tell you, when I was a teenager, I didn't want to be a pastor. I, it's hard for me to express how convinced I was that there was no way that I was going to be in the ministry. You know what I'm saying? I was doing everything possible to not. Growing up in church, watching my dad pastor, I'm like, for, just forget it. The whole church game is stupid, and I'm out. As soon as I'm, as soon as I can be out, I'm out, friends. I'm out. I was planning my escape. <laughs> and yet here I stand. And what I say, no, it's not a big deal. And and I, <clears throat> and listen, and I don't say that because it's not better to be a pastor than it is to be anything else. It is good to be who God has called you to be is the best thing for you. So there's nowhere to go from the presence of God. If I ascend to heaven, you are there, verse eight. If I make my bed in jail, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness will cover me and the light will be my night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. Verse 13, you formed my inward parts. Who formed them? God did. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Who knitted you together? God did. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. I was not made in secret, intricately and woven in the depths of the earth. Fearfully and wonderfully made. That's who you are. You were made, you didn't make yourself. And if you were made, the, the, the purpose giver who made you has something to say about your life. But you aren't a watch to be used as a hammer. Man, there's heavy deception out in the world right now for you just to be whatever you want you to be. But God fearfully and wonderfully made you. Young people, you have to wrestle with this. God has made you for a reason. You were not your own. You were bought with a price. He designed you and created you. See, and as, as we finish this series, my hope and my goal is that we will all prayerfully, young and old, yield to the purposes of God. Jesus, when he went to the garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified, what did he say? He said, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And this needs to be our heart cry as followers of Jesus. Nevertheless, not my will, but what you want. The one that wove me together in my mother's womb, the one that created me, that created me for a design and for a reason and for a purpose. Matthew 10, we don't have this on the screen, but Jesus said, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And that's a great way of thinking. If I just do my own thing, I'm just gonna lose my life. 
but for the sake of Christ, for the sake of my Savior, for the sake of my Creator, if I I lose my life in Him, I find it. Why do I find it? Because He made me with a purpose. And His purpose will go against the grain of what the world says that I should do. And again, as we finish, here's another prayer what we call in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6. Pray like this. He says to his disciples, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I desire your will. I know the voices out in the world are clamoring. They're loud. They say a whole bunch of things. But God, you created me on purpose and for a purpose. I want your will. Let's pray today. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for who you call us to be. And God, we say that about ourselves. We say about us who you say we are, who we are in Christ. we are according to creation and salvation. And God, thank you that you are walking with us in this moment. God, we thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit who's here today with us, convicting us and changing directions, changing thoughts, changing words. God, we humbly yield to your will. God, we say that your ways are better than our ways. Your ways are higher than our ways. So we thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Hey, before we go today, if you are here this morning and you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm gonna pray a prayer here in a second. I invite you to pray along with me. And this prayer is just a starting point with God. Everybody needs a starting point with God. The gospel, the good news is all about Jesus, that he came, lived a sinless life, died on the cross. God raised him from the dead. And because all of that happened, God just offers to us a relationship with God. It's it's a free gift. It comes by grace. We can't earn it. So if that's you today and you've never said yes to Jesus, I invite you to pray along with me. Or maybe you're in the second category where you used to be in relationship with God or you feel really distant from him today. You know, God is not mad at you today. God is inviting you close to himself again. I invite you to pray along with me as well. So church, let's bow our head and close our eyes and let's pray this prayer out loud. Praying with somebody who might be praying for the first time or somebody who might be rededicating their life to Christ. God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he lived a sinless life died on the cross and you raised him from the dead so I could know you so today I say yes to that relationship I say yes to your righteousness God I call you my father Jesus I call you my lord God I purpose to follow after your ways and I turn from my own I thank you for salvation today In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate with those who made that decision for the first time today. Yes, we are so excited and thrilled that you made that decision to follow Jesus today. And so if that was you, take the connect card in the seat pocket in front of you, turn that into the info desk. I want to give you some resources as you walk out your faith over the next couple of days. Maybe you'll have questions like, what did I get myself into? What am I supposed to do? We just want to come alongside you. So make sure you turn that into the info desk. We'd love to celebrate with you and give you some more resources for your new journey of faith. Hey, before we go, just have two really important announcements we want to recap. If you are a parent in the room, I need you to be game day ready. Okay, registration for a city kids camp opens up today at 3 p.m. Set those alarms. Everyone has been saying it, but those registrations fly quickly. Okay, so make sure that you're ready to go get some 
game day paint on if you need to so that you can register your kids for City Kids Camp. And last but not least, do me a favor, grab this invite card that was on your seat when you came in. Come on, grab it. Make sure you have it. Uh, We want to encourage you to invite someone. Next week is Easter Sunday. It's going to be so much fun celebrating. Yes, it's going to be fun celebrating Resurrection Sunday here at church. Uh, We want you to invite someone to church, not because we want it to be hype and a big party here, but we really do believe in the message of Jesus. We believe that it can change someone's life. So make sure you take this. Be prayerful about it and invite someone. We're praying for boldness for the person who is holding this card and openness for the person who will receive it, knowing that God's going to do what he can only do. Let me invite you to stand today as we get ready to go. If you came to church this morning hoping for someone to pray with you, our prayer team's coming down in the front. They'd be more than happy to pray with you for anything that you're facing in your life. We're so excited. Thank you for being at church this morning, but we will see you next week on Easter Sunday. Come on at 8.30, 10.15 or noon. Have a great week. We love you so much, city. You are dismissed.